Hi, this is Guy Wallace. In this video, I'm going to cover part two of my adventures in performance-based training and development with me, your host, Guy Wallace. We're going to cover the years 1982 to 1997. I've subtitled this series, The Insomnia Solution. Not my insomnia, yours. Just kidding. We're going to cover the 15 years that I worked with my business partner, Ray Svensson, the late Ray Svensson, 1982 to 1997. I left Motorola in October of 1982 and my first day on the job with Ray Svensson was November 1st. We, uh, were, we flew to Houston to begin work the next day with our client Exxon Exploration USA and that evening that we arrived in Houston we went to present at the NSPI chapter and we presented on job modeling via a group process. Um, this is a methodology that uh, was going to become central to much of our consulting practice, bringing together groups of master performers, other subject matter experts, sometimes managers and supervisors, and sometimes novice performers, to capture an articulation of performance, the enabling knowledge and skills, and then to meet again as a design team to create a design, either at the curriculum architecture level to develop performance-based training and development paths, or to build, uh, develop performance-based training instruction, which includes job aids, standalone job aids, job aids embedded in training, and training when you really needed to have the learner, the performers, memorize content, uh, topics, tasks, etc., and also to hone skills. Training shouldn't be used when we can get by with a job aid that will provide the instruction on the job, in the workflow, at the moment of need. The work at Exxon was a follow-on to the work that I had done while I was at Motorola and I had been asked by Ray Svensson and my wife at the time, Karen, to take the analysis data that they had generated in their work with this Exxon Exploration USA group, uh, particularly focusing on the geophysicists and the, um, the geologists that were involved in searching for oil. My job was to meet with the client and help them develop some templates for use to populate this modular curriculum architecture design, a training and development path for those two job titles. Um, and what had been going on is that uh, I had done the design, the organization had seen the design, the field people had seen the design, they loved it, and they were waiting for the central training organization back in Houston at headquarters to start developing content, but they weren't getting on with it right away, and so the field started developing content and it got kind of out of control. There was a overlap of content beyond the specifications for the various modules that came out of that curriculum architecture design effort. And so it was going to become a big mess. So they were in a hurry to have me come down there and create uh, two modules using their subject matter expertise, because these were people who had worked in the field in these jobs in the past. And then from that, we were going to systematically derive a template from that and then provide these blank templates out to the field and ask the people there to repopulate these templates with the content that they'd already created and include the things that were missing. Some of the content that was supposed to be in that, of course, were things like advanced organizers. You know, what's this all about? Who's this for? In what context would this be, uh, this instruction be appropriate? Uh, specific learning objectives, uh, probably just the uh, terminal performance objectives and not the enabling knowledge and skill objectives, but I can't remember, it was a long time ago. This was, again, 1982. Uh, then we'd have short frames of content, and we would include quiz questions. Uh, that uh, This was all self-paced training, so the learners could take this and answer the questions and see what the answers were, uh, or their bosses could check them. And then there was performance criteria, that theoretically would be used by the supervisors to make sure that the learners actually had learned this and then they'd be observed doing that kind of work and get a critique. And we were sharing all that content, the criteria included, with the learners so that they would know what the tests were 
um, and they would be open book tests if the if the world that they worked in was uh, open book and they could refer to reference manuals and vendors manuals and things like that. So because the field had jumped ahead of the training organization, the training organization found it necessary to get this and make this happen right away. So I spent a couple of days with them creating all of that. So my work at R.A. Svensson and Associates uh, was the curriculum architecture thing, CADs as we called them. And so I did a lot of CADs. By the second year, at the end of 1984, I had done nine CAD projects for our clients. At the end of four years, I'd done 16 projects. Another two years after six years, I had done 21. After 10 years, I'd done 41. And by the end of 1997, when my work with Ray was done, I had done 62 of these things. By now, here in uh, 2020, well, the last one I did was in 2018, that was my 76th CAD project. Performance-based curriculum architecture designs, developing training and development paths, reconciling existing content where it would be appropriate, identifying content that needed to be updated, modified in some manner, and also gap content, what's missing. And that allows clients to prioritize where they want to make investments in training and development to positively impact performance for their business operations. Ray, Karen, and I, and another associate, Doug McKenna, published our first article on curriculum architecture design in Training Magazine back in September of 1984. So this does go way back. We wrote that article in 1983, and uh, we actually wrote that article, it was the second of two articles. We submitted one of them to Training Magazine on the curriculum architecture design process using a group process. But we had written an earlier article and submitted that to NSPI's Performance and Improvement Journal and we were hoping that that one would come out first because that one addressed conducting analysis, instructional analysis, via a group process. So we wanted it to be the one-two punch, analysis and then design. But they came out 2-1. So one of them came out in September of 84 and the next one came out in November of 84. The publishing cycle at that time, once you submitted an article back in the day, it took 11, 12, 13 months for something to actually show up in, in one of these journals or magazines and then hit the field. Um, one of the key things that was mentioned in the article that was published by NSPI was that the methodology that we were using, what I now call today a facilitated group process, is based on a nominal group technique. Uh, where you facilitate a group of people to come up with the answers and define certain things. Very much like design thinking, agile efforts do, do nowadays. But none of this is new. None of that is new. It all goes back uh, way before I started using it. In 1987, Ray asked both my wife Karen and I to become his business partners. We had grown the business uh, quite successfully, we'd added staff, uh, consultants, and production staff back at the home office, so to speak. Um, but our accountant advised Karen and I that only one of us should join Ray, and the other one should maintain our own separate business. And so she joined him formally as a partner, and I maintained the business that we had been working under, and that was the Wallace Works. Uh, which we began in 1982. But in 87, she joined him as a full formal partner, and I was really a shadow partner. So I had a say in how we did things. I owned the instructional side of the house, so to speak, while they did strategic planning for training and development and other performance improvement projects. But as I pointed out to them back in the day, training, instruction is where we're making all of our money. That's where all of our projects are. So I will take that on and you guys go off and do these other things. But the strategic planning projects that Ray became known for, wrote a great book on, a workbook, uh, gave excellent guidance to people that wanted to do this on their own without us. Um, those projects often led to curriculum architecture work. So he did the kind of that front end and then I came along and did the curriculum architecture projects and a curriculum architecture 
design project does not generate any new training. It simply identifies what are the performance requirements, what are the enabling knowledge and skills, what content do we have already that we could use, reuse as is or after modification, what content do we have that is NA, not applicable. Others might think that we should be using it, but no, it doesn't fit for whatever reasons, and we needed to document all that. That led on to addy like projects, which eventually I started calling MCD, Modular Curriculum Development and Acquisition, because often you're acquiring other content and modifying it, whether you buy it or you find it in-house, and you're trying to reuse it. You're trying to re-salvage or salvage those investments of shareholder equity. Too often, training organizations convert shareholder equity into instructional content and then they don't organize it well, which leads to other groups building the same content over and over again. They don't maintain it, it goes out of date. They, we treat it like it's throwaway, and it's not. It's the conversion of shareholder equity, their investment dollars in the business, to instructional content. And uh, we do a really poor job of uh, managing those investments. Um, <clears throat> One of my favorite projects during those 15 years working with Ray was uh, with Alcoa and another project with AT&T Network Systems, which is the old Western Electric Group, the manufacturing arm of Ma Bell AT&T, as it was known uh, back in the day, uh, with General Motors and with Hewlett Packard. And I'll talk a little bit about each one of those. Um, some of my least favorite projects, well, I guess I'll skip that because that's probably not a good thing to get into, but I did have to fire a client at one point. Um, we were falsely accused of, uh, of delivering something at a higher price than what the original specification called for, but I had the letters and documentation where the client actually asked me to change it. We went from a three-day program to a ten-day program, and of course those cost more. And uh, um, somehow the people internal to the training organization didn't send that up, didn't get the proper approvals, and so it became a finger-pointing exercise. And uh, I was very unhappy with that, and so I decided I can't work for those people anymore. I can't trust them. Uh, we, you know, it's preferable to have a trusting relationship with your customers and suppliers. Um, that created a lot of tension because Ray and Karen continued to do work with this customer and they were kind of all for forgiving this uh, you know invoice that we had sent them but it was just under five hundred thousand dollars and this was 19 in the mid late eight late 80s actually um, and so that was a very bad experience and that just made me wary made me work extra hard to make sure that everybody involved was up to date in terms of what we were supposed to be doing and making sure that they approve that and having the appropriate documentation uh, to make sure that uh, I was covered, if you will. Um, I'll start with my Alcoa project. Back in 1984, I was given the assignment to work with uh, people from headquarters in the laboratories, Alcoa laboratories, the laboratories. Um, on a project for flat roll process technology. Now, the flat roll process technology involved casting an ing ingot of aluminum, alumina, and um, flat rolling it, rolling it to be thin enough then to become part of an aircraft wing or the panels on the side of an aircraft, etc. Or roll it even thinner and make uh, aluminum cans for your beer and your soda pop and even roll it thinner for you know aluminum foil I mean that's what these people did they rolled they cast an ingot they put it through all the kinds of processes that they needed to do so what they wanted me to do is because the technology was changing and the things that they were coming up in the labs were going to change the manufacturing the production process uh, they wanted to get the news about what was coming down the pike out to the field engineers, the people in the manufacturing plants where these, uh, where this aluminum was, was rolled flat. And they gave me 12 people that were going to be instructors and gave me a two-week window and said they wanted to do this all in two weeks. And I sat in meetings where they were discussing these kinds of things and at the end of one meeting I said, you know, 
We've got 80 hours to cover what seems to me something along the lines of about 800 hours of content. How are we going to do this? Well, people were nodding their heads. Yeah, there's a lot here. You know, 800, 800 hours might be a bit of an exaggeration, but maybe not so much, Guy. And uh, my goal was to work with these. And I thought, how am I going to work with these individual instructors, these experts, and get them to pare down? Because they were asking, you know, I'm going to need three days and I'm going to need four days to cover my content and, you know, the heck with everybody else because my stuff is most important. So I had come up with a kind of a, a rough idea of how I might do this, how I might direct these 12 people and skinny down what they were going to. And I, and I asked, you know, can we do this? I have this idea. Every kind of, everybody kind of rebuffed me. So one of those meetings that happened in the Alcoa headquarters building in Pittsburgh, it's, you know, everything else is a steel structure or brick structure or something like that. And their building is aluminum, so it's a, it got a very unique look on it. And I was in my client's office, who, he was a big shot, so he had a nice big office and a little seating area over to the side. And I was sitting over there pondering, you know, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? And I said, Fred, Fred Stewart was my client. And Fred was uh, renowned throughout the company. Uh, you know, he was one of their sharpest engineers and highly respected by everybody. And I said, you know, Fred, let me, let me just clarify some things here. Aren't there seven major phases or stages to the production process for this whole flat rolled process that the technology uh, revolves around? He said, yes. And so I said, well, let me make sure I got the, the right nomenclature. So I started writing down, you know, what is number one? What's number two? What's number seven? And filled that all out. And then I said, now, if I understand things correctly, there's, there's four or five major metrics that you apply to the final product. You know, is it really the right thickness? Is it right the right metal composition? Is it truly flat or is it a little bit uneven, a little bit thicker on one end than on the other? And so there were these, and he said, no, there's five. And so he gave them to me and I wrote those down and I created a matrix, a seven by five matrix. And I said, can you help me understand I was trying to be Socratic about this. Can you help me understand, you know, the intersection? Where where does this measure or metric for the final product get impacted in the seven-stage process? Can we put a high, medium, and low in here? And so we started doing that. And we found that some places, some of those cells needed to have a zero in it because there's absolutely no impact. This stage of the process doesn't affect that measure at all. Give it a zero. Okay, and so some of these highs, however, um, gee, they're a little bit higher than the other highs. And so we, I said, well, let's just do double H, double high. And that's a signal that, you know, that's really, really critical to that measure, that part of the process. And, and then we looked at some of the others and, you know, some of the mediums were really medium, high medium, and some of them were medium low. And so we used that to uh, identify the impact of this stage of the process and the next stage of the process to these various metrics. And we ended up calling this thing an impact matrix. And I said, this is exactly what I wanted to use, thank you very much, to help me guide these instructors. Now I'm going to need some help because they're not going to just listen to me, but we're going to have to allocate time based on what they're talking about. We should spend most of our time on the double H's and the H's and the HM's and we should spend zero time on the zeros and the lows and the medium to lows. I don't know about the mediums. We'll have to figure that out and see where the time goes. And he took a look at that and he stared at it for a while. And then he just picked it up and he walked out of the room and he came back a few minutes later and he'd made a copy at the Xerox machine and he gave me my original back and he said, I'm going to keep this. This is interesting. And we concluded our meeting and I left and went back to Chicago from Pittsburgh. And he called me the next day and he said, Guy, this is fabulous. I just met with the head of the labs. They were here in Pittsburgh. The labs were in uh, Tennessee, Alcoa, Tennessee. And he said, this, you know, we, we sat down and took a look at this and we were looking at the programs, the research projects that they had going on in the labs. And now we started to use this impact matrix and we basically stopped some projects, stopped projects that were ongoing. We decided to stop projects from even starting and to focus on these double H's and the H's and the HM's. 
And he said, this is fabulous. I said, well, I'm glad you, you're getting your, some use out of this thing here, but you're going to have to help me with these instructors because they're going to fight me because each one of them, it's obvious from the meetings we've already had, thinks their stuff is the most important stuff. And so we're going to have to find a way to pair all of that back, and I'm going to need your help. And he agreed, and that's what we did, and the course was very successful. Two years later, I was asked to help them update the course, <clears throat> And we did that with our new Macintosh computers and the uh, uh, because they made better graphics and things like that for our overhead transparencies, the old what we used to call slides or foils that we put on the overhead projector and had that projected on a big screen on the wall. And, you know, that was the technology of the day and that's what we were using. But my client was very excited about that. And eventually that same client said, oh, you know, we're, we're a PC company. We can't use this Macintosh stuff. You're creating stuff that's not usable for us. So I had to make the conversion with my staff, who really wasn't happy about that, from because we had gone from IBM Selectric typewriters to Macintosh computers, and then we had to go to the PCs because we could create content then that was useful to our client. We could hand that off, and they could take it and run with it and then update it themselves and not necessarily need us anymore. So our, our flirting with uh, the Macintosh world was uh, short-lived, probably two, three years at the most, and then we had to make a conversion, and I gave all those Macintosh computers away to our staff, who then took them home for their families to use. Um, that The next project I want to talk about started a couple years later. In 1986, Ray Svensson and I were leaving uh, an NSPI conference. We were in San Francisco. We are at the airport waiting for a shuttle bus. Uh, uh, to take us to the terminal that we needed to go to and Ray bumps into somebody that he's that he has known for a long time from AT&T and uh, I forget his name but he's he asked us you know how are we doing what we were doing Did, he didn't he saw us wandering the halls at the conference but he didn't check into our session and so he's and Ray says oh guy presented on Cricket architecture design this is his second year in a row presenting on this and and the guy asked you know so what's that so we explained it to him and he said, you know, I have a project that we're just about ready to start it back in AT&T. And I think you need to come visit us next week and talk a little bit about your approach to doing this here. Because we had done a few by then. And uh, so Ray and I went to go visit him. And years later, I found out that uh, our competitor on that project was my key mentor, Gary Rumler. And uh, we had won that project away from Gary, but I didn't know it at the time. And, you know, it all's fair in love and war and consulting battles um, and so we got this project and it was a target audience of about 800 people product managers and product planners the junior level across four different strategic business units and over the course of my work with them they became five strategic business units and went to a population of 1100 now these people were managing 500,000 products this was everything that you needed to have a telephony business, the telephone business. So all the Bell operating companies out in Illinois, Indiana, and all over the country, a bunch of different names here, usually state by state, because they were publicly regulated by public utility commissions. So the regulators were, were heavily involved in all of this, but there was one big family, AT&T, back then in those days. And, but AT&T had just been broken up. The monopoly had been uh, taken apart by the uh, U.S. Justice Department. Uh, they didn't want it to be a monopoly. And so th their world was going to change. And McKinsey had told, the, the consulting company McKinsey's uh, consultants had told AT&T Network Systems, this old Western Electric uh, uh, group, the manufacturing arm, that they were going to need to change drastically. And one of the things that they were going to have to do is, is you know, improve the professionalism of their product management uh, cadre. Um, because what these people were currently doing was they were product expediters in the factory. Uh, if some central office in the middle of Ohio had burned down, you know, they were going to get bumped to the top of the list to get the new switch and all the rest of the equipment they need so that they could get back into business. And so whoever was expecting that next switch, well, they were going to have to replan and, and everything readjusted to that. But these product expediters through the factory, um, that's, that wasn't going to cut it going forward. So they needed to have a more professional approach. They needed to really train people to do the job. And so that's the project that we got. 
and Ray, Karen, and I each did the analysis. We went. We weren't allowed to do this using facilitated group process and bring people together uh, for a three-day meeting or whatever, and and identify what is the performance and what are the enabling knowledge and skills and what are the various roles and responsibility. Who's in this performance sandbox, so to speak, with the product managers. Uh, who does what? You know, where are the shortcomings? Where are people failing? Where are there people who are actually doing a super job at this? And so we spread out and, and did uh, a month or so's worth of interviewing and go back to our office in Chicago and try to pull all the data together. And no one in the client organization had any kind of a picture or scheme for what does this job include? And we came up with eight major functional areas. I would call them areas of performance, but the client didn't like that, and so they were just functional areas. Eight different portions of the job. Doing sales support, doing financial analyses, doing marketing, doing service support, working with the factories, the manufacturing uh, entities, and uh, even strategic planning. So where are we taking this product line or this product family? Are we going from analog to digital or what? And so there was many challenges here and prior to product managers taking over these responsibilities, how it worked was that Bell Labs just came up with the latest and greatest technology and figured out how to build it in the product and what feature sets should be there and they designed it and the manufacturing world built it and they sold it to the bill operating companies who often didn't know what this was going to cost until they got the invoice you know because they were just going to take it they were going to take what was given to them by ma bill and <clears throat> so that world was all going to change and AT&T network systems was going to have competition with the bell operating companies from other providers the good news for them was that no one in the Bell operating companies necessarily knew how to buy something from anybody else. They'd never specced out their own needs and then went searching and bought the right product to fit into their system, their network. And uh, so network systems had a, a window of opportunity to get their act together and improve their approach and really become responsive to the customers rather than just shoving product out into the field and the customers would have to take it or leave it. And basically, they couldn't leave it, they had to take it. So it was a very interesting project. Um, so I did, I did the curriculum architecture design taking all the analysis data after we had reviewed that with our key clients back in uh, uh, New Jersey. And I did the design and created it and we took that back and said okay here's what we did with the analysis data that you approved and they really loved it this was great it had a performance orientation they could see it in the titling of the modules of the modular curriculum architecture and the big training and development path that we had put on flip chart paper and uh, I was following what later on I started to call truth in titling. I want the title to be reflective of what is this content? What is it addressing? So I had some rules. I formalized them a, a, a couple of years later. Uh, if, if the preface to the title, if the title was XYZ or ABC, if it said how to colon ABC, well that no kidding was how to do it. Uh, but sometimes the target audience didn't need to be told how to do something. They already knew it. It was close to what they were already doing. And what they might need is a knowledge level. Let's give them the new knowledge, and that would be sufficient. And their prior, uh, not, their prior knowledge would kick in, and then they'd be able to go perform uh, appropriately. And uh, so if it didn't have a preface to the ABC or XYZ, well, then that was a knowledge level. And if it said overview of colon ABC or XYZ, well, that meant it was an awareness level. That means the audience knew so much about this already that because they're degreed engineers or they have a marketing background or whatever, that we could just make them generally aware of this and that would be sufficient. Sometimes you needed to be aware of what some other group is doing so just so you're in the know and you don't have to have deep knowledge of that and you don't have to have a skill on that. You just need to be aware. And so we were able to take the knowledge and skills and basically create awareness, knowledge, and skill levels of content by design and populate the curriculum architecture with this modular instruction. 
and label it appropriately. Well, when clients look at a training and development path, what nowadays we call learning paths sometimes, but when they were able to look at that and read the, the titles and look at how much time did we think, it was an estimate, you know, plus or minus 25% was my weasel words, um, they could say, yeah, two hours on that, yeah, that makes sense, and four hours on that, yeah, that makes sense, and oh, 16 hours on that, oh, I don't like it, but yeah, that's probably right. And because it was a how-to, and we would explain, well, these how-to modules of content would have over 50% hands-on practice and exercises. So if you're, if you're thinking that somebody's going to give you a lecture out of 16 hours, well, at least eight hours of that is going to be hands-on practice with feedback, um, what I later called application exercises. So that project was very successful, and there was uh, my organization working with Ray. I brought in a bunch of freelancers, and we built out the front end of this training and development path. The path had, the curriculum architecture had, um, the 1000 series, the 2000 series, and the 3000 series, you know, basic, intermediate, and advanced, if you will. And uh, so there was onboarding that led to ongoing development. So onboarding development to ongoing development. And so the onboarding stuff was, you know, things like, uh, here's an overview, the, the first module was a video. Um, that would explain the whole curriculum and the planning process and the second module was actually creating a sitting down with your boss and creating a training development plan and and the third module was basically welcome to AT&T but if you've already been an employee of AT&T you don't need that so you can skip that welcome to the strategic business unit uh, welcome to the various uh, facilities and locations of that strategic business unit. Uh, this is the business that we're in. These are the products and service that we rented to the marketplace. Here's the marketplaces we serve. Here's the competitive situation going on in that marketplace. Things like that. And there were other basic things such as you need to begin to learn the word processing software because all of that was, you know, starting to come out. And many of the modules that we created on the front end of this curriculum were CBT computer-based training. It was kind of new at the time, and AT&T was kind of leading in, in some of these areas. But they we had a combination of on-paper booklets, self-paced readings, because that was one of the things I had learned at my time at Motorola, is to try to convert everything that I could from group-paced to self-paced, to make it much more easier and flexible for management and their employees to get the training that they need right away, and not to wait till some scheduled class came up on the calendar because that may not be timely enough. And so I tried to move everything that I could into these self-paced modes, uh, booklets and CBT. And there were a couple of uh, classes that already existed on using some of the software that was prevalent in AT&T at that time. Um, and at the end of the 1000 series, there were like uh, 60 modules all together. And at the end of the 1000 series was a 10-day course, instructor-led training, and it was basically what I was calling a keystone course. You take everything that you need before that as appropriate, and then you come to this course here and you'll have a lot of the background knowledge that we expect you to have in terms of, you know, what does a financials look like? What does a product plan look like? And now you'll come to this 10-day course. It was 10 days in the pilot session back in October of 87 during the big financial crash that happened then. Um, and then it became eight days. But uh, in that course, you would learn how to facilitate, to plan and facilitate product team meetings, which was the key part of the job. You were bringing together in your product team meetings people from Bell Laboratories, uh, and there were more than one laboratories, and so there's other laboratories as well. But there was uh, manufacturing representatives in your meeting, because Bell Labs would design something, manufacturing would have to produce it, Sales then would have to sell it, and service would have to install it and maintain it uh, unless the customers themselves were doing the maintenance. So we carved up the world uh, for our simulation exercises on running product team meetings. So we took a class of 20 people, divided them two groups of 10, and we paired up people so that two people would be operating as the product managers, two people would be representing the labs, two people would be representing manufacturing, two people would be representing sales, and two people would be representing service. And 
in one set of exercises, the people would be working on various products. And so I created this huge simulation and they were working on cameras and recorders and editing equipment and cables and tape. This was 1982, remember. Um, and so that was the product line and it was basically a system that had to work together much like the client in the real world the various strategic business units were building parts of a system the telephony system the telephone system and so there had to be a coordination between all of them but anyway so the the two people that were product managers, they would run their meeting. Everybody would get what I call data packs that would give them the information they needed to play their role in the meeting. And for example, um, the manufacturing people might say, you know, we had a fire uh, last week and what the manufacturing plant that we were going to build this product in, it's burnt to the ground. And so now we're going to have to go someplace else and that's going to delay our schedules <clears throat> and it's going to cost us more money. So we're going to spend more money than we thought. It's going to take longer before we start selling this thing and generating revenues, and that's going to impact the, the financials. Um, and so th these are the things that they had to deal with. And after they ran their meeting, these people would participate. Everybody would shift hats, you know. So the product manager became uh, the Bell Labs people, and every, all those roles rotated across the 10 people in pairs. And th so... I would learn how to run my meeting in one phase of the product life cycle because we were using five phases of a product life cycle. So I would play the role of product manager and then I'd have to switch hats and play the role of uh, uh, the design engineers and then the manufacturing people and then sales and then support in the very first phase of a product's life cycle. And not only would I learn about the product manager's role and what they really need to do, I got sensitized, duly sensitized, to the issues, the real world issues that Bell Labs had at this phase, uh, stage of the life cycle, that manufacturing had, that sales had, that service had. And so I'd have to actually represent those in these meetings when somebody else was playing the role of product manager. And so if I read my script correctly and then acted it out, um, uh, I became aware of some things that were going to hit me and if I'd been in the product management world for a while these things rang true because this is exactly the kind of stuff that I heard about when I sat in on these meetings whether I was in charge or not and so the so these ten people on one side of the room if so to speak would be running these meetings in a separate room actually and they'd be switching hats and so by the time this was all said and done five role sets against five products you had you were going to sit through 25 meetings and you're going to have to run five of them and you were going to have to produce a product plan and the financials at the end of each one and we had people who played games with the financials you know hey sales said that they would sell a hundred thousand of those at this price i raised the price i raised their volume and we said well that's not going to play out very well when you go back into the real world what you really need to do is take the numbers and the data that people give you and then and then uh, calculate the financials and show your product team we're going to lose money on every sale is that you think that's going to fly we're going to have to really work harder to get this these financials into better shape so sales what can you really do and they say uh, the labs is designing feature sets into the product that i really don't think my customer wants they're not going to pay for that stuff so we have to say to the labs, okay, you people have to take those features out. What can you do about changing the price and your delivery schedule so that manufacturing can build these? And manufacturing, if we cut out those features the sales is talking about, what will be your manufactured price to those? And so, so then if we add our margin to that sales, can you sell 100000 or more at this new lower price? And They'd look at their data packs and say, well, yeah, if you can do that, you know, I've got a little table here. Um, I, you know, and I tell them, don't show that to them. That's your information. Make them drag it out of you. Make it that them elicit that because that's their job is to elicit the information that's needed in front of the whole team. So everybody's on the same page, calculate the financials and show that to everybody. So they're on the same page and either the financials are good enough or they're not. And you're going to have to work harder to figure out how to turn those financials around or your recommendation to management might be to kill the product because it's not going to be financially viable. Well, 
So our clients love that. The people that went through the course loved it. I had people with MBA say this was better than my MBA program. I learned more about business and financials in this. But it was a very intense course and 60% of it plus was spent in these running product team meetings and a couple other things too, like how to prioritize uh, your busy calendar and decide what to forego and what to really pay attention to. These were real world things that product managers had, had told us about when we had done the analysis. Um, so that was a, a very interesting course. Got to build that eight day program. I, I delivered the pilot because my rule for my staff was, hey, when we build content, I will deliver the lessons that I created. You will deliver the lessons that you create in the pilot session and then you'll have to get the earful of feedback in case something's not quite right. And if it, we're not doing instructor-led training, we're doing self-paced training, well, we're gonna, we're gonna put people in a room and have them take the self-paced training and then we're going to get their feedback and you're gonna have to listen to it. So they're gonna know that you created those pages and I created these other pages and they could give us an earful if they needed to. Uh, so you have to live with the consequences of your development efforts. Um, so I wanted everybody to have a little, my, my team to have skin in the game when we were doing those kinds of things. Um, so the, the pilot session was very successful and the client said, Guy, I really like the way you delivered that. I want you to, to do the next deliveries. And I said, uh, I don't do that for a living. I do analysis and design and development kinds of stuff, but I don't do delivery. And he said, yeah, but you did such a good job of that. Um, it was the first delivery really that I had ever done um, other than a, uh, a two or three day problem solving class teaching Kepner Trego's problem solving methodology to Baxter International in the Chicago suburbs. But uh, so he said, well, tell you what, there's the rest of this curriculum that needs to be built out. I'll give you even more development work if you'll agree to do this delivery. So he gave me the golden handcuffs and I took that on and I ended up delivering this eight day course. 31 times, including five times in the Netherlands. Uh, I'd gone over the Netherlands uh, to review the analysis data that I had, the design that I had, all the people over there loved it and their managers were trying to, I remember being in a big meeting and the managers coming in and going, okay, but how can we get this eight day course down to like three days? And the people that had seen this course said, no, we want what the Americans are getting. We don't want anything less. Uh, this looks like if this is great stuff, this is what we should be doing. And so the manager said, uh, all right, we'll try it for a while and see how that goes. And uh, they could never get the rest of the organization to agree to pair that back. It, it eventually did. I did the deliveries until 1994. So this was, I did the deliveries for seven years. Um, and they were running you know, three of these a year or four of these a year. I was delivering them in Boston and Atlanta and in Chicago and in the Netherlands. And uh, those were the major location centers and in New Jersey. Um, so it was very interesting pro project. And I learned about a lot about product management, of course, and thinking about products within a system and thinking about products and their components and their individual parts, piece parts, and all of that. And I started thinking about my approach to curriculum architecture design a little bit differently. Up until that point, I'd created these paths of modules. It was a modular curriculum and module, 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 module. And I said, you know, I want to change the word from module to event, training and development event that would be modularized. So a modular event and the modules inside the event were called lessons. And the lessons themselves were modular. And a lesson was composed of a bunch of different things that I called instructional activities. Instructional because, of course, they're supposed to be instructional. And activities because I wanted it to be active. No passive stuff if we could help it. I mean, some things can be delivered as passive instruction. And the audience can take it and go forward and do well with it. But... But, uh, but I wanted it to lean into being active, kind of learning things. And uh, so the type of instructional activities, there were three types, that, besides the open and the close to a lesson, which were critical, because in the open is where you'd put your advanced organizer and the learning objectives, just the terminal performance objectives, not all the enabling knowledge and skill objectives. 
because those two levels of objectives are for the developers of content, not for the audience, because you'll kill them with all these objectives and they'll be asleep by the time you get to the meaty part of the prod of the uh, training. And at the end where you're, you're forcing at the close of a lesson, you want to basically say, okay, this is what we did. Let's reflect on that. How will you use this back on the job? What are the barriers you're going to face? What are some strategies and tactics that you can use to overcome those barriers? And here's how this leads to the next lesson or the next several lessons or five lessons from now we'll use this uh, and in between we'll learn these other things and then we'll pull it all together five lessons from now whatever whatever the situation was so I went from having a modular curriculum architecture design of just modules to this three level articulation in the design so training and development events that were modular with lessons and the lessons were modular with instructional activities and so I had three levels of design now that were coming out of this well uh, so that was a very impactful project uh, a long-term project but I started changing my approach to instructional design at the curriculum architecture uh, level and then I still use that at the ADDIE level, what I call MCD, Modular Curriculum Development and Acquisition. Because sometimes you're not building from scratch, you're taking something that already exists, because this is the big deal for me, and using it as is or modifying it. And so you have to modify it by taking out examples that aren't authentic to the target audience and the practice exercises with feedback you might have to modify those because no one likes being trained to do somebody else's job they want to be trained on their authentic job requirements and so i believe in that fully um, again a very interesting project and it had a major impact in terms of my own approach to this architecture of instruction or the it could have been called engineering of instruction but Ray Svensson, as I covered in the very first uh, of this series of videos, um, brought it to me as a curriculum architecture. So I'm using that language, and it's old school. But but uh, all of my content that goes back to 1982 makes some evolutionary changes, but it uses the same language because I don't want to throw people about. You know, how is a curriculum architecture different from a curriculum engineered thing? You know, we. Uh, there's a proliferation of language and overlapping terms and phrases in the instructional design business and uh, I don't like it and I think it's a disservice to our customers, to new people coming in and trying to climb the learning curve. Um, so I tend to stick with language even if it's a little bit old school, that's just me. In the middle of me doing that first work with AT&T Network Systems for Product Managers, uh, my business partners Ray and Karen were doing some work with NASA and they were doing work when the Challenger accident happened and uh, those people got killed. And, you know, it's the old ring thing. And uh, uh, so the decision uh, by management was that, well, we need better management training. And I'm not sure that that was really true. They didn't have really good formal management training. But I got the assignment to do a curriculum architecture design for management training for people at NASA at all their various locations. So it would be the same thing for everybody. And uh, uh, my wife at the time, Karen, and one of our associates, Mark Graham Brown, did the analysis. And they warned me before they brought me in to do the, run the design meeting with the people that had been involved with them in the analysis team meeting. We were using a facilitated group process, bring together all the top people who we want everybody else to emulate. So let's learn what, well, how they think about this, how they approach that, and let's steal all their good things and, and package it and transmit that to the rest of the people. Well, they warned me, Ray, uh, 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 Karen and Mark warned me that in their analysis team meeting, people often broke out crying because things that they were talking about reminded them of these people that had been killed in the Challenger accident. And and so I, you know, I heard that, but I went to the meeting and then I was really shocking to have to work with people and facilitate people and give them time. I'd ask a question, three people would break out in tears, and I'd have to stop and suspend the process until they kind of you know shed their tears and and they would say okay let's let's proceed and uh, so it was a very strange meeting it was it was uh, 
for the hardest meeting I think I probably ever had to run. Uh, but so I, I did that, I, ran, I facilitated that and we came up with a design and everybody loved it and it was very successful and then uh, some of my staff uh, helped to build out some of that content and a lot of the content was the kinds of things that you could purchase make the modifications to or leave it as is or you know just preface the exist some vendors content and say okay they use this language you'll convert it to this but don't worry about that now take that generic content they take it and now there'd be a bookend on the back end and say okay they called it this we want to call it that and etc um, but it was a Again, a very interesting project. And uh, one of my souvenirs from back then <clears throat> is this hat. Um, again, uh, very impactful and my uh, Ray's organization, um, which hadn't changed its name yet, so we were still R.A. Svensson Associates, uh, we continued to do work with them. And I was busy with AT&T, so I went back to my AT&T network systems client and continued my work there. And the rest of Ray's organization continued to work with NASA and, and some of our other clients. We usually had, you know, five, six, seven, eight clients at any one time. Um, then a couple of years later in 1989, I did my second CAD project on CAD curriculum architecture design on computer-aided design. CAD systems, computer-aided design systems, are the front end of computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing, and theoretically people do design of the product to be manufactured on a computer, and then all those technical drawings, which are all digitized, go over to the manufacturing and they build tooling and things like that so they could produce the products that were designed um, by the CAD front end portion of that system. But I'd done one of those before, but this second one was for a, uh, a big company. And <clears throat> the interesting story on that is that after uh, they had a CATIA system, which is a French vendor for this CAD system, CAD CAM system. And, but all the draftsmen who were used to working at drafting tables with paper and pencils um, were struggling with this. They were producing bad stuff. The uh, they do their designs on this stuff. The tooling would be made. The product parts would be made, and then they have to scrap everything, including the tooling. Very expensive, uh, huge rework costs and scrap costs. And so, the client wanted to do something about this. Well, this customer I had done several other projects before, and so when this issue hit my client's desk, they brought me in and had me work uh, with the people doing the work and with their in-house expert on the CATIA system and try to frame this curriculum architecture, which I did. And we were doing a readout of the design and the implementation costs that were probable given our estimating of you, here's some content you have but it's got to be modified, so that's going to take this amount of effort and this many dollars, and here's some stuff you don't have at all. You're going to have to build that from scratch. This is about how long it's going to be, and so therefore it's going to cost you about this much. And when all is said and done, your implementation costs are going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 million. Well, I, I was presenting this to a room of about 25 people, and all hell broke loose. $2 million? Are you kidding? Why? What kind of empire are you trying to build here? And... Uh, which is something that I had learned to expect at this point because this stuff isn't cheap to build performance-based instruction that's actually going to teach people how to do the job, no kidding. And so I said, okay, let's, let's, let's figure out, you know, if this is worthwhile. And I knew that client well enough to know that these people didn't talk in the language of finance. They talked in the language of TQM, Total Quality Management. And there's a couple of concepts there that I started to use and that was the what's the cost of non-conformance when you have performance problems that's non-conformance to a standard so what's that costing you is that worth like a nickel a month uh, ten thousand dollars a month a million dollars a month ten million dollars a month what is the value of the problem which is what's the value of the problem to be solved um, and and then the other concept is the cost of conformance so what's it going to cost to fix that 
So if you have a nickel problem and you want to spend a dollar fifty to solve it, well that's a negative ROI and so that's no good. But if you have a million dollar problem and it's going to take you a half a million dollars to solve that, that's something we should talk about because that may very well be worthwhile. So th this room had broken out and people are yelling and screaming at my client and at the subject matter expert that I'd worked with. And they go, two million, two million. So I said, Let, let's, so how many people are in the target audience? I knew the answer, so I'm doing this Socratically. Just got to be careful with hemlock. If somebody tries to give you any. Um, so there, there's a little over 100. And I said, okay, let's, 100 people, let's keep this simple. And what's the fully loaded salary? And they had to talk amongst themselves and come up with an answer. But they decided it was around $65,000 salary and all the costs for housing these people and giving them everything that they needed to do their job. So $65,000 times 100. Well, that's $6.5 million a year that you're spending on salary for these people. Okay. So that's what you're paying now. So what are you getting for that? So how proficient are they in general? Across the board, these 100 people, if we had to guess how proficient are they, what are they? 75% proficient, 50% proficient, 25% proficient? Less, well, people were saying five and 10 and 15% because these people don't know really anything. They're really struggling with this, but we're all guessing. And so I eventually got them to agree that let's use 25%. We think it's worse than that. So this is, we're taking a conservative view of this. So 100 people, that's a conservative view. $65,000, some people thought that was a conservative view. They thought it was more. So the, you know, the, the cost on the, for the payroll was just $6.5 million all by itself. And these people are only 25% proficient, which means that what you're getting for your $6.5 million is you're getting $1.625 million worth of value. So on the performance table, so to speak, what you're leaving because these people aren't very good at what they're doing, they're struggling with this new technology, you know, there's like a $4.8 million difference every year. So there's $4.8 million on the table. Do you think it's worthwhile spending $2 million to go after that? And maybe we can't get everybody to 100% proficiency. So let's just say that we can get them to 75% proficiency. What would that number be? You can do the math. Um, you can find this math in an article that I wrote that got published in um, 1980 or 91 in AT&T's Technical and Skills Journal. Uh, they changed the title of this costing out a training project. Well, that's really wasn't was. It was really about determining the value for developing training against the need. But anyway, so editors do that. If you've written and published, uh, you know that they have a tendency to do that. What made sense when you wrote it doesn't make any sense when they published it, and there's not a lot you can do about it. But I was happy about that whole article anyway because my name ended up on the cover of this journal right next to Joe Harless's. He's one of my heroes, and so I was very, you know, happy, you know, for me. Um, but uh, so this 6.5 is what you're paying every year, and so the 4.8 that you're missing grows every year. And so if you're thinking about a two, three-year window, well, you're talking about, you know, well over $12 million is what you're leaving. And so are you willing to spend $2 million now, and let's call it, you know, let's add an extra $500,000 of that for, you know, delivering the classes and the people's time off the job and all of that. So, yeah, let's add that to it. But is it worth it to spend $2.5 million to get $12.5 million back in three years? And the room kind of went quiet and everybody thought, yeah, okay, this makes sense. The $2 million is kind of not such a big deal when you look at it in that context. So the cost of nonconformance... $12 million could be solved with a cost of conformance of $2 million. And that easily converts into ROI. And so let the financial bean counters use the ROI thing, but the TQM people, the people who are all in the quality stuff, they know these concepts. And all of a sudden, now this makes sense. So what I learned in that is, uh, um, and I learned it before, but this was a, a prime example of this is speak in the language of the customer. Don't use your instructional design speak or your performance improvement speak. Figure out what their language is and use that. Um, it's a way to kind of manipulate the situation, if you will. But if the, if the math doesn't work out, 
then you'll just simply prove that this is an issue, this is a training need that's valid, but it's not worth going after. Or we have to find some other cheaper way to go after it. And if that, that cheaper way won't solve the problem, then that's the dilemma, and that's why managers get paid the big bucks, so they can decide what to really do about this situation. Anyway, so I remember the clients going, well, not only is it the salary dollars, I mean, that's really nothing, this $12 million. If we were to count up and, and figure out what the value of the scrap, tooling, and parts are, and there were people in the room who knew that you never, ever wanted to figure that out. We'll just ignore that because that number is way larger than the salary number, and if management figured out that we were managing a situation that had that kind of a problem in it, we'd all be looking for new jobs. So they were happy to use just the salary approach rather than talking about all the additional costs, which just were, you know, more than the cherry on the pie. It was the, it was most of the pie. This was, we were talking about the crust when we were talking about salary dollars. Anyway, so that was a great project and I, and I really enjoyed that experience even though sometimes these meetings these review meetings with my project steering team can become quite hellacious um, but that's how it is uh, the next interesting project was uh, something that we had done for Arco of Alaska and Arco of Alaska ran one half of Prudhoe Bay, the oil fields up on the north slope of Alaska in the Arctic Circle where it gets very, very cold in the winter time. I went up there in December, so it was darn cold. Um, but the job that uh, we were brought up to talk to the clients about and we sold them on this was they wanted to do what they were calling a pay progression program. They didn't want to give people pay bumps, pay increases, just because you'd spent another year here. They wanted to pay for people's performance capabilities. And so they had brought in, they had two failed attempts prior to bringing this in. And these two failed attempts, both consulting groups created a bunch of paper and pencil tests, which tested people's knowledge at best. But these were oil field technicians, you know, they're called roughnecks in other parts of the world. These are not the kind of people who want to take any of your stinking paper and pencil tests. And so everybody hated it. They hated the idea of this. And they didn't think that there was enough proof that you were going to pay me differently based on these tests. And I don't take paper and pencil tests well, but hey, give me the job to do and I can do it. But don't ask me questions about that. And so I remember hearing the story because I didn't go up there for the first initial meetings with the client, but, but uh, you know, so my colleagues flew from Chicago to Seattle to Anchorage and then an eight hour flight to Prudhoe Bay. Alaska is a big state. And <clears throat> they were met at the, uh, at the airfield there uh, at the oil field and they were taken to the place where everybody lived and all the working spaces uh, that weren't outside at the oil facilities. Um, and they're all built on stilts to keep off the permafrost so that the, you know, human heat and the heating in the buildings wouldn't melt any of that permafrost. So they're all built on stilts. Very interesting environment to work in. Um, but, but my colleagues, my two partners and, the, and some of our staff went up there and they were confronted at a management meeting which was invaded by people top people from all these technician groups 20 technician groups who wanted to hear what this was all about now we're going to have a what a third failed attempt you're bringing another consultant group and they're going to produce something stupid and we're going to hate it and so we're here to stop this nonsense from even starting and so they voiced their complaints and ray and karen explained to them well this is our intent. Um, we would build what we call performance tests. And if it's an open book test, if you get a vendor's manual out and you do the work and you're going to, you know, repack a valve or do maintenance on some piece of equipment, 
That's the test, is doing the real work, the authentic work. There will be no paper and pencil tests as far as we can see. We want people to be able to actually prove that they can actually do the work. We're going to create a performance test. It'll have the criteria. Somebody will proctor that test. They will administrate that test. They will observe the performance. They will check it off. If you violate any of the safety procedures, you're, you fail immediately and we'll stop the test right in midstream. But if you can do the work and get it done in a reasonable amount of time and do good work, you pass the test. Well, these people love that idea, but you know they're still a little bit leery because you know consultants, blah blah blah. Um, anyway, so we sold everybody on, or they sold everybody on that. They came back to Chicago and told me, and I'm still doing all this work with AT and T, and they said, "Okay, guy, we need you to modify your curriculum architecture design process and instead of specking out a path of training and development events." Um, and instruction, we simply want to spec out all the various performance tests. And since we do a performance model and the enabling knowledge and skill analysis, we can spec out these performance tests. And we know what people need to know to be able to do the performance. So that's part of the criteria and all that. Um, um, there were cases where you couldn't shut down their communication system and cut them off from the world and so they couldn't control the, the oil fields. Um, so you'd have to simulate that and we would come up with either you come up with a simulation or a talk through troubleshooting where somebody said you go you look at the, all the gauges and the third one on the right it says red you're in the red so what do you do and they'd have to tell the person proctoring the test and they'd say okay I'm gonna go check this and I'm gonna go check that okay so those are either the right answers or the wrong answers okay that first thing that you went to go check the reading was this and then the second thing of the reading was that what do you do next well, I can ignore the second thing, maybe, and I can focus in on the first thing, because that's where the problem, the root cause of the problem, lies somewhere in that part of this. And so we had actually doing, we did these tests with actually real work or simulated work, or where simulating the work was impossible or impractical, we would do talk through troubleshooting. So those were the three modes that we used for performance tests. And in the and so I modified the process and I trained a bunch of subcontractors that we hired in to help us with this because I had part of the staff working on all this AT&T network systems product management stuff and yet we were doing this other project uh, up in uh, Alaska and I modified that and to test it out um, I was part of three pilot test sessions, if you will, to run analysis team meetings to gather all the performance, to capture it in what we call a performance model and the capture of the enabling knowledge and skills and what we call an enabling knowledge and skill matrix. And Ray ran a meeting, Karen ran a meeting, and I ran a meeting, and we were going to test out how well this would work on the front end of this. And then we would build tests, a couple of tests out of that data and see how that worked and prove to everybody that either this was going to work or this wasn't going to work. And we proved that it was going to work. But what was going on at the time was that um, the company, Arco Velasco, was going to start laying off people. This is a case where one part of the organization is making decisions and the other part of the organization doesn't even know that's coming. And all of a sudden it hits. And so we're going to run these three meetings, and in the meetings, we've taken the top master performers from each one of these three technician groups that we were going to do the piloting on, and they were going to come into our meetings, and our client was very worried. These people are going to be angry. They're going to be upset. They've lost their jobs. Many of these people have been getting pink slips. Not everybody, because we're retaining some of them for our own staff, but we're going to start outsourcing this work. Well, you know, at the beginning of each of the, our three meetings, we brought this up and said, is this going to be an issue for you guys? And the people that had been given the pink slip says, nah, I got my pink slip. I'm going to take two weeks off and go fishing. I mean, this is Alaska. I'm going to go hunting and fishing. And, you know, this is perfect. I love it. And I, I've already got a job with one of the suppliers here. That's, you know, so all the work guy, don't worry about this. The work is moving to the supply community. The work doesn't go away. It's just going to be done by the supply community. And those of us that got pink slips, we're, we're the best of the best anyway, so we're going to work with the spike. We ain't going nowhere. We're just going to be wearing a different badge. And uh, so our client was really shocked, and we had predicted this was going to happen because we've been in meetings before where there's a bunch of turmoil, but you get master performers into a room to talk about their work, 
and have them meeting with other their master performers, their peer group, even though they know these people or only know them by reputation, and they're gonna they're gonna talk about their work. And this is how I do it. How do you do it? And yeah, I do this thing. Or, or Joe, you said that there was those five steps, but actually, buddy, if you really think about it, in between step two and three, aren't there like these five things that you got to do? This and this and this and this. And Joe would go, Yeah, sorry. Well, you know, this goes back to the situ issue that you know all of us, everybody, including experts, subject matter experts, which we rely heavily on in the training biz. Uh, are working and operating on non-conscious knowledge. Um, the, what the research shows is that you can work with a subject matter expert and they can miss up to 70% of what a novice will need because there are things that they have automated and it's no longer in their conscious memory. They just know what to do when it confronts them, but they can't think about it consciously. They can't tell you about it. If you theoretically had uh, Bob Mager's gun to their head, you know, they couldn't tell you every step. They could do the work, but they couldn't do, tell you what all that work entailed. They couldn't tell you what behaviors they would exhibit, what their cognitive processes were, what they were thinking about, the decisions that they were making. They couldn't. They had automated all of that stuff so they could actually do the work because we can't keep all of those details in our working memory, in our conscious memory, so it all becomes non-conscious. So master performers love being in a room with other master performers because they're learning their tricks and comparing themselves to others. And of course, it's a big ego game for master performers. And of course, I feed that. I say, you know, you've been handpicked by your, by the project steering team members, and here's who those people are. And they handpicked you guys and gals to be in this meeting here because you're the best of the best. And we want to train everybody to be, you know, try to get close to you guys. Of course, they probably never will, at least not right away, because we're going to train them based on what you tell us, and then they're going to learn on the job, blah, 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 and all the informal learning and social learning kind of happens in the trial by error learning, uh, unless it's high risk, high reward kinds of stuff. But so we did that project. It was a, a very interesting project. Our organization built over 2,000 performance tests for 20 across 20 different technical populations, and I think it was 22 populations by the time we ended because other groups were added in because they wanted in to, on the action as well. So seven years later, uh, in 94, our client at, uh, at the oil facilities at Prudhoe Bay took a job on the pipeline itself, which connected Prudhoe Bay to Valdez, a port in, uh, near Anchorage, Alaska, um, you know, where they piped the 800 mile pipeline, sent the oil to Valdez. And so the people that maintain the pipeline, they needed the same thing. They wanted to do the same thing. They wanted to have a pay progression system and they wanted to pay people based not on seniority or time on the job. They wanted to pay based on what is it that you can do for us. And the more things you can do for us, the more that we're willing to pay you. So that guy sold the pipeline people on hiring him and he brought us in seven years later and the way the Justice Department works and antitrust laws and all that kind of thing, they couldn't simply take the performance tests and all the data that we had and move it over to the pipeline. So we had to redo the whole darn thing all over again and many of the technician job titles and task responsibilities were exactly the same as up in Prudhoe Bay. Um, because they had pipes up there too. And so there was nothing new on the pipeline that hadn't been needed on the oil fields. But we were hired and came in and brought a new crew of staff up there. And we spent, uh, I forget how many months, uh, but we produced 2,000 performance tests, just over 2,000 performance tests for that. And they had about 20 different technical populations as well. And again, all, they almost mirrored exactly what we had done in Peru Bay seven years earlier. Um, one of the things we learned from, from that client group, I remember meeting one of the key people who, uh, you know, shepherded us around and kept us from getting lost up, up in Prudhoe Bay, a guy named Moose, <clears throat> big guy as you can imagine. But Moose saw us at an NSBI conference a couple of years later and said, you know, that project has been so successful that we actually sold uh, an effort to the Chinese government to go over there and run some of their oil fields. And what really sold them on us, Arco of Alaska, was that we had all these performance tests and we could actually show them the names of the tests, the type of performance that we were going to train Chinese nationals on. 
and build their skills so they could run this oil field and we will have the job of setting it up and getting it up and running and we'll leave you with the oil field and a skilled workforce. And that was extremely powerful and I don't know what that was worth to them. He said it was worth a lot and he couldn't talk about it, but he was just wanted to tell us that because he was so excited about that. He was very excited to be involved in the whole project from day one and he was one of our key supporters and project champions and he was the one who would, you know, we'd go into some meetings and people would, you know, grumble because they just hate anything and it's a bunch of consultants and he would read them the riot act. He's a big guy, so you had to listen to him. He would read them the riot act about sit down, shut up, and listen to these people here. And if you don't like what they said, tell us about it at the end of the meeting, damn it. You know, and so that's what happened. Anyway, Moose was a, a friend of ours and helped us with that. Um, let me turn the page here. Um, so one of the things that became apparent to me, uh, by the time we got to 1994, um, I was struggling with some of the people in our organization and how they did these analysis and design meetings and in particularly the front-end analysis meetings and my problems weren't with my staff who all reported to me so they would do the analysis the way I had now evolved it to my problem was with my two business partners who were used to doing analysis the way we were doing it in 1982 and 83 and as I started shaping this and I changed from you know I had 10 categories of enabling knowledge and skills and now the official number was 17 and they would use the 10 and they wouldn't capture the data the way I really wanted it captured that would make it easier and facilitate the design process and using the analysis data in the design process so I was going back and forth and shaping you know how did I do design what did I really need from analysis maybe if I configure the data a little bit differently it'll make it easier in the design process so that's what I did I was moving the whole methodology forward but they weren't so I struggled with that because it was going to be very very hard to change their behaviors and I couldn't apply enough consequences to them to force them to do that which is what I wanted to do so I hit on another approach I hired a staff member onto our production staff at uh, what was then uh, SWI, Svensson and Wallace Incorporated, although we were rebranding and calling ourselves SWI. I hired somebody in exclusively to build me a database because databases are very forgiving. Either you have all the data for all the fields or you don't. So I converted the performance model format that we are using to capture data and the knowledge and skill matrices formats to capture the data and building that and surrounding that and enabling all of that with a database. So when I did curriculum architecture design projects, all four phases, the first phase is project planning and kickoff. The final product of that is the approved final project plan. This is what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, how we're going to do it, who's going to be involved. That and everybody's name and contact information were all in the database. Then we would go do analysis and all the participants, all their names would be in the database, all the analysis data we produced. The analysis report was one of those things where you just, you know, press a George Jetson button and boom, the analysis report would come out because you'd populated the database and it would put that in there and they'd give you a draft and then the consultant could edit some of the standard text that was in there, fill in the blanks with the holes and all of that and then word processing would clean it up and make the copies and ship them off to the client or get them ready for the consultant to drag them to a review meeting. Uh, the second phase was, uh, so second phase was analysis, third phase was design, fourth phase was implementation planning. Because the thing about curriculum architecture designs is they don't create any new content. They define the performance need through the performance model. They identify the enabling knowledge and skills that are required. They also identify the target audience and, you know, what do we know about them? How homogeneous are they or mixed are they? You know, what can we safely assume if they're all electrical engineers and we're not going to have to cover this AC, DC electrical theory that the knowledge and skills talk about because they're degreed engineers. They already know that. So, yes, it's necessary to know that, but it doesn't need to be included in the training. Um, and so we were able to 
use the target audience data to help us inform the design, what we needed to really address and what we didn't. The performance model told me here's the performance, the outputs and the tasks, no kidding, that people have to produce and how. Here's the skills, what they got to know to be able to do. And the fourth type of analysis was looking at any existing training and making assessments of that to see if we could reuse that content as is or after modification or again, not as all. This is really critical for me. But anyway, so I built, had this database built, and now Ray and Karen couldn't really play. Because the staff would say, well, wait a minute, this data, I gotta populate the database with this data here, and you don't have it. So they would have to go rework their analysis data to put it in the database. Um, or they'd have to hand that off to one, some other associate and have them reconfigure the database. So eventually I got them to move to the new approach that I was using because I had this database, which also saved us time, uh, saved us errors. You know, a lot of the world works with acronyms and we would type it in right one time and then we'd have to type it in another way uh, in a someplace else and we would, we would get it mixed up. And so the database, if we got it in there right the first time, it would be right from here to the very end of the project. A uh, very powerful tool, something that I called the uh, PAC tool because my methodology, both the curriculum architecture design and my addy like uh, MCD, modular curriculum development, I created an umbrella term for this. this we, these were the PACT processes for training and development or instructional design. And PACT stood uh, for performance-based, accelerated, customer and stakeholder driven training and development. And uh, PACT also meant we had an agreement, a PACT, a bar, you know, we, we had an agreement with the client that this is how we were going to do this project. And we could do it quicker if we used a facilitated group process and brought master performers together. And instead of taking weeks and weeks and weeks to do analysis, we could get it done in three days. Instead of taking weeks and weeks to do the design, we'd do it in three days. Those were my standard default numbers for the number of days to do this. Sometimes you could do it in two days. Sometimes you needed four. Sometimes you needed five. It all depends. But so it was easy to figure that out. Um, clients could see, you know, what the burden was going to be. There were no surprises. Uh, you're going to have to give up your best people, short-term pain for long-term gain. Uh, your master performers are going to be in this three-day meeting and that three-day meeting, and then they're done. That's it. And then here's where the client and the key stakeholders they would be the project steering team here's when they would meet how much time that would take here's you know so we could forecast and predict the burden on everybody we understood our cycle times and touch times so i could schedule these review meetings and never miss a meeting date the only time i missed a meeting date is when the client called up and said we didn't think you were really going to have it done by now can we can we move this out two weeks because most of the people didn't put it on their calendars they because they thought you'll never get it done in that time well we did and and we were able to and so one of the things that i appreciate is that clients like predictability they like predictability of schedules and of their costs and the burden on people's time so that everybody can plan around that kind of stuff and so that's what drove a lot of the uh detailing of the methodology so that we could do that um the so i was able to use that training or excuse me that uh, database and the new methodology and i want to shift gears here to uh, a project that i had with general motors and general motors called me in and i think it was about 1993 and they said guy we've just uh, done this big project and ray svenson was part of this so he understands this but uh, we did this project called bugum B-U-G-M, which stood for Best Under General Motors. What General Motors had discovered when they began to look across all of their training products is tremendous overlaps and gaps, and mostly the overlaps were killing them. They would have the same content built into 10, 15, 25 different courses, which meant their first costs were 25 times higher than necessary and now their maintenance costs were killing them. And so as they were uh, dealing with all the complaints from the trainees and their management, hey, your content's out of date, that's not even valid anymore. 
so you need to update that. Well, they'd go looking and they'd say they'd find all. So they went under this big initiative to clean up, to throw away content, to go find the master files and burn them or something and get rid of them and settle in on, you know, just the best of the best. So if they were going to have an active listening course, as one example, they'd have one and not 27 inadvertent uh, uh, versions of it when it was not necessary. Sometimes that's necessary, sometimes it's not. But uh, so they, I, they heard me out, they saw my four-phase process and all the steps and tasks and blah, blah, blah. They decided, you know, ooh, you know, get away from us. This is, uh, this is next to evil. This is way too complicated. There's got to be a simpler way to do this. And so they excused me and I heard about later that uh, from Ray, who was still working with General Motors, uh, the OED group, Organizational Effectiveness uh, and uh, Development Group, um, which later became General Motors University. But uh, so they decided they were going to embrace this methodology out of uh, Ohio, uh, Ohio State University's uh, DACOM process. And I had looked at the DACOM process back in 81 when I was at Motorola. And DACOM is an acronym that stands for Design a Curriculum. And uh, but if you looked at what actually DACOM was, it wasn't had any nothing to do with design. It had everything to do with analysis. And it used it, it gathered analysis data three buckets. What are the major duties? What are the tasks? And what are the skills? So the major duties, that was fine. You can chunk out anything just like the ADDIE process chunks out, you know, the chunks of our own uh, development methodology. Not everybody likes the ADDIE or uses it, but, you know, that's one example. And then they would say what the tasks are. But you do task analysis, like task analysis back in the old days, you don't know what the output is. You got these, all these tasks, you can list all these tasks, you can show it to your client, and they'll look at that and they'll go, yeah, okay, these have face validity. Yeah, the, we do this, we do that, we do this, we do that, we do this. Yeah, you want me to sign off on this? Okay, because that's, yeah, we do that stuff. But you don't have any clue as to what the outputs are, what the worthy outputs, to use Tom Gilbert's phrase, are of all the task performance. So in my approach to analysis is you understand first what the outputs are, and then you want to know what the tasks are to produce that output. So you begin with the end in mind and you look at the output and you understand what the measures are, which is again looking even further than the end in mind. It's just, uh, you know, who establishes the measures for an output? Well, downstream, that downstream customer or user, they establish what they want that output to need. Uh, regulators, other stakeholders say what that output must be, you know. Um, and so the Dakin process was missing all that. Now, I don't know what Dakin does nowadays, but that's what it was doing back in 93, 94, 95. And then it goes after skills. So just any way to collect skills, you know, you'd look at the skills list, it'd be as bad as a task analysis, just a whole bunch of skills. And you didn't necessarily know which skills fed and were necessary to which tasks and which tasks led to these major duties. I mean, sometimes that was apparent, but sometimes the skill that you captured early for, you know, major duty number one, maybe that skill was needed in major duty number seven as well, but it wasn't always clear that that was the case. So, but that's where the way General Motors went because that looked simpler, easier. So two years later, they call me up and they want me to come back up and do the same darn presentation to their staff here because, as Ray told me, yeah, they used the Dakin process and they've created more redundancy than they had in the past. They could see that coming. They were just having people going off and doing Dakin stuff and there was no way to centralize looking at any of this to go, hey, we've already got active listening. Here, use this one. And if you've got to use this content and you've got to tweak it and create a derivative, that's fine. In Guy's method, we, we can track derivatives, the parent-child relationship between the original content and any derivatives that we create. And that way, when it comes time to maintain this stuff, we can find it and maintain it and reduce our first costs and reduce our life cycle costs for maintenance, for administration, you know, just for keeping the file system of all the, the masters and all of that. Um, and so they called me back in and they wanted to hear from me again. And I go up there and of course I got to do this because, you know, they're Ray's client at this point. And so I present the whole darn thing all over again. And I started getting, you know, questions and, you know, attacks about 
you know, isn't there a way to simplify this? And I go, well, you already tried that, so no. You know, basically, uh, you take out key steps here, and I've tried, I've made this very lean, and lean manufacturing, lean production were becoming things at that point. And uh, so I said, you know, I have leaned this down to what's absolutely necessary. There's not one piece of analysis data that I generate in my methodology that doesn't make its way into the design or influencing the design directly. You guys clicked a whole bunch of stuff that you never ever use later on design. Isn't that true? I look out to the instructional designers in the room and they'd be nodding their heads, yep, we are forced to collect a whole bunch of stuff here and then we never see, you know, why did we do that because we don't use it. So there were instructional designers in the general on the General Motors staff and in their supplier community, including people from Raytheon and General Physics and probably a half a dozen or more local Detroit area um, consulting firms, uh, instructional design shops that uh, were intrigued by this. And they were kind of excited that they were going to get a chance to maybe learn this. So anyway, General Motors decided, yeah, okay, we're going to do this, uh, but guy, we don't like your your label CAD. Curriculum Architecture Design, I mean CAD. I mean, you know, our people are going to get confused because CAD stands for Computer Aided Design, and, you know, we're, we're just going to confuse people. Well, I strongly disagreed, but <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, yeah, now I think your people are smart enough to figure out the difference between curriculum architecture design, that version of CAD, and CAD, the curriculum, uh, the uh, computer aided design that leads to computer aided manufacturing, blah, blah, blah. But uh, so they insisted that I help them create a derivative of my entire methodology set. They converted curriculum architecture design to modular curriculum. Not that that's a bad label, but, you know, I've been doing curriculum architecture kinds of things since 1981 when Ray Svensson told me about the concept. We'd publish articles on curriculum architecture design. I didn't want to create a new label for something because that made it just more difficult for people who wanted to read about it, try it, call me up, ask me questions, do it on their own without me. Uh, you know, I didn't want to be switching the marketing buzzwords around this for no good reason. But that's what they wanted to do. So CAD became Modular Curriculum MC, and my MCD process became MI, mo Modular Instruction. So they had Modular Curriculum led to Modular Instruction, just like my CAD led to MCD work. And uh, so, you know, I've got a lot of stuff. i got a database. i got all these forms and tools and all these reports and project plans, analysis report, design document, implementation planning reports. And then when you get into the modular instruction portion of this, the ADDIE level thing, yeah, there's a project plan, there's an analysis uh, report, there's a design document, there's the actual developed instruction. Uh, there's a pilot test methodology with a pilot test report, and so now I had to change every stinking form and report and document and change my database just for them. And so, I kid you not, I spent a uh, million dollars of their money just making these unnecessary conversions simply because some of the people thought that CAD would be too confusing to everybody. Um, <clears throat> anyway. So I did that work with them starting in 95, and it ended in 2000. Um, in the, just after we had started, the OED group became General Motors University, GMU. And the, they, were, they were putting the, the, for example, the head of Saturn was relieved of the, being the head of Saturn, and he was given the job of heading General Motors University. And he was in the job for, I don't know, four, five, six months, something like that. But anyway, so over a 24 to 36 month period, there were four leaders of General Motors University. So there was turmoil at the top. And then they brought in a fifth person from outside the company. And that person looked at everything and said, okay, I'm gonna get rid of all of these vendors and all these methodologies, and we're gonna use what I used at my last company where I was very successful, successful enough to get this gig. And so we all got booted out. So they had spent all this time and energy, a million dollars. I had trained and certified over 400 people in being an analyst, a CAD designer, an MC designer, an MCD designer, which is different, uh, the, at the Eddy level, they're MI designers. 
their lead developers who were supposed to be participating in the MCD or MI, it's confusing I know, designs and that lead developer then would take and lead the development team and give everybody their assignment for the lessons and instructional activities they were to develop and but that would be the glue that held everything together that would be the baton that got handed off ideally they'd be involved in the analysis meeting as well um, so they would understand the analysis data they would understand how that converted into design they'd be able to take that design forward and they'd be able to control their developers who would look at their assignment to develop lessons two three and four and realize that there's a bunch of content missing here so I'm going to build that content into here because the design is faulty and my design for lessons two three and four are missing stuff so I'm going to build it in there well the lead developer was supposed to do a kickoff meeting and orient every developer to the entire design so that developer would have known that it's not that content isn't in two three and four it's actually in six and seven and eight so you're going to build redundancy inadvertently into our content and you use slightly different language and all that stuff and make it a real mess and so the lead developer's job was to bird dog all of that and and look at what was being developed to make sure that the uh, continuity was there that the integrity of the design was maintained once it went into development and yes there are things that got missed in the design and your subject matter expert and master performers might tell you about that and then your job as a developer is to figure out this thing that's missing is it coming up later in the design and that person is expecting it to be handled now up front here with this but actually in the design it's being held uh, handled later in the sequence in the flow of the content so the lead developer was a key role in making sure that the design the performance orientation the uh, the that the design was held to and built out and allowed people to build in things that were inadvertently missed from the analysis data and because when you're doing analysis you gather so much and when you do design you're actually doing a little bit of analysis and design too because people are working with us and are going you know something that's missing in all of this the old XYZ times two and people go my god how did we forget that okay yeah let's create a little thing here and plug that in and the same thing happens when you go into development somebody goes yeah there's XY2 but there's also this ABC123 thing that's missing and I don't see it anywhere and your lead developer would theoretically go and look up and down the design and go you know what it's missing let's plug it in here does that make sense is that you know so so you're always amending your work as you go forward and continuing to do more and more micro analysis when you get into the development phase, you're doing more micro design. You're actually doing the real design of the application exercise. Should this be a case study? Should this be, you know, work under fire, live work, real work, or simulated work, or some sort of a talk through troubleshooting kind of an exercise? Because trying to simulate the real world is problematic for whatever reason. Um, and so those were so so those were the key roles and not only was i training people on how to do this but in the over the course of what i was calling the packed process technology transfer pptt just to be cute about it and it's written about in chapter 25 i think in my book lean isd but i insisted with to the client that if i'm going to train somebody they're going to have to sit in a real live project and observe and if I could have a cry room built in the back of the room so they could hear and see us and we didn't have to see or hear them because what's going to happen is that anybody with a master's degree or a PhD in instructional design is going to say well this is not consistent with what I learned what about this what about Gagne what about and I had predicted this and it turned out to be true that people the the more education formal education they had in this the more they struggled with my methodology because it was different yet there were some who could say hey here's where Gagne's nine events happen within Guy's methodology they could translate that um, but so people had to observe what they were going to learn to do and they could only ask their questions of me after the day was over with and I would take time after facilitating a day's worth of analysis or design and then entertain their questions 
and either defer their question to tomorrow when we might get to what they're talking about or answer it right then. But I didn't need them interrupting the flow of the work and causing worries and skepticism with my master performers because I was taking them out of their work and putting them in this meeting to capture what they knew. And so you'd observe it, then you'd go to guys training, usually a five-day course, you know, 60% plus was hands-on exercises of practicing with feedback as we could shape your behavior. You'd observe other people doing this. You'd learn from their successes and failures and the feedback that they got. And we'd build your skills that way. Uh, then you would go out into the world and you would become an associate to somebody who had been certified capable of going solo. We had different levels of certification. If you were a level three, you'd been certified to go solo. You don't need to have somebody there watching you or whatever. We trust you. Go do it. And we would pair up somebody who is coming up the learning curve with somebody who is certified to go solo. And that person that was going solo would have, you know, have that associate help them out doing this doing that and after a few meetings maybe they would you know they'd be given a chance to do the work too um, and then the person that had been certified to go solo would nominate them so that they could go get certified and then me or someone on my staff would go out there and there were two people in the General Motors staff that I was training so that they could become masters of all of this and they could go out and certify people which meant that they had to get certified first um, so that we would say that, okay, they've demonstrated that they can actually do this on their own. And they would go solo and there'd be backups there. The person doing the certification observation, they'd be able to step in and so save the day if necessary, but we didn't want to do that. We'd want to see if people could work their way through some of these things. Um, and if they had actually proven that they could do it, we would certify them. And then they would be able to go solo and then they'd get an associate to help them out. Um, so it was a very extensive effort, very costly for General Motors, but they decided, the new guy at G GMU decided, okay, enough of this. I don't understand it. It's not what I'm used to. Let's end this. I'm being brought in from the outside to save this place because it's in turmoil. And but there were issues that uh, came out of that effort, and one of them was that uh, my clients made uh, their customers jump through every hoop when sometimes that wasn't necessary. So if you're doing skills training, that's one thing. If you're doing knowledge or awareness level training, I mean, to me, skills level stuff is training. Knowledge level stuff is education. Awareness level stuff is communications. And maybe what the client wants is to communicate broadly and there's no other channel to get this word, this message out to everybody other than using training. And that's what they've been doing forever anyway. So they're used to that. So they come to the client and they say, hey, I need to get this stuff out here. And my client would force them to go th jump through every hoop. So I, I had said when I heard about this, no, that's not true. You don't have to ju have them jump through every hoop. Well, what do you mean? Well, come on now, if they just want to create some awareness of some new stuff, you don't need to understand the, prof you don't need all of that stuff. So I wrote an article um, that uh, was titled MCD Light. And then I gave it to my clients and I go, you, you may, you know, if you want, I'll create a version of this that we'll call MI Light because my MCD is your MI. And there's, here's a way to shortcut that when, when you do your investigation, when you first talk to the client about the project they want, you might quickly come to the conclusion that this is awareness level stuff that they need to get out there. And yes, it'll impact people's performance, but the knowledge and skills of the target audience are already sufficient and you just make them aware of A and B and C and they can go out there and do the performance correctly as you want them to do it from here going forward. So there's no need to jump through all the hoops with the detailed analysis and the detailed design if, you're, if that's what the situation calls for. Well, they got upset with me because, you know, if they had to go and turn around, go back to their clients and tell them, well, actually, you don't have to do every last thing guy told us. And uh, so they kind of rejected that whole notion. And so they were going to... So 
that built up some animosity. Uh, nobody could do anything quickly. We were going to treat this as if we were building nuclear bombs and we didn't want it to blow up in the factory. Uh, we wanted it to blow up out there in the field. And, uh, you know, to, to the clients, you know, that just didn't make any damn sense. And to Guy, it didn't make any damn sense. But my clients couldn't figure out how to negotiate that. They were so used to establishing a process and not having any shortcut processes because shortcutting a process sounds bad, but actually it's quite smart at times. And, uh, but anyway, so that was a huge issue. So that was part of the turmoil. Customers, their customers complaining about all this. The people either loved or hated the MCMI processes. Uh, if you really wanted rigorous training and build skills in people, you loved it. If you just wanted to get the word out, you hated it. And so the new guy came in to take over GMU and he heard all this stuff here and he decided to clear the decks and start all over again, if you will. And so that's what happened. So that project ended in the year 2000. Um, my next story is about Hewlett Packard. And in 1989, uh, I was hired by Hewlett Packard to address their um, <clears throat> information technologists and uh, take a look at, you know, what are, what's the job and what are the what's the performance what are the outputs and what are the tasks what are the enabling knowledge and skills what content do they already have in the hewlett packard world of training um, how to reconcile all of that and create a curriculum architecture and then they built it out and reused content as is or after modification they really like that stuff of course you know the whole concept of curriculum architecture came out of information technology at the bell system center for technical education so of course you know IT folks would like this. This is this made sense to them. Yeah, take this seven uh, things, uh, lines of code, and plug it in over here, and put some stuff before and after it. And we got a new product. Yeah, it makes sense. But anyway, so Hewlett Packer really liked this, and I started working with a woman, uh, Christy Westall, and Christy uh, worked for my client, and she was assigned to be my guide to help coordinate, you know, make, set up the rooms and make the invitations, make sure everybody's going to show up. Guy showed up and ran the meetings and Christy observed that stuff. And then she was, in, did the role of at the Addy level, building the content, buying the content, putting it in place and getting it out there. Two years later, they came to me and said, you know, hey, the world is changing rapidly all the time. And so in 91, we did a refresher of that. And I took the analysis data and ran another meeting and walked people through the, a new group of uh, IT master performers and they looked at the data and they tweaked it here and tweaked it there. We found out that there wasn't very much there to change, but there were some things to be changed. And so that meant go to the existing set of curriculum, the content, the instruction that was already out there and go tweak it or get something new and plug it into the whole you know, sequence of uh, the continuum of uh, instruction. And then two years later, in 93, they came to me and they said, well, we need to do this again. But, guy, I'm getting sick and tired of paying you to do this for me. So, uh, is there any way that you can train Christy so that she can do this and that I can go forward in life without you? And I said, that's what we do. So, I'm happy to do that with you. And so, here we talked about a couple of ways that we might approach this. And basically we decided, okay, we're going to do uh, a new job that wasn't the IT world. And when Christy was done with all this, she could tackle the updating of that one. But let's pick something new, start from ground zero, if you will, and do a brand new curriculum architecture design. And I will work with Christy. She will co-facilitate with me. She's watched me do this twice. I will brief her before she is given a facilitation assignment. I will debrief her at the end of the day. These eight hour days are gonna be 10, 11 hours because we're gonna do briefings in the morning and debriefings in the evening. And because if we're gonna run a three day meeting, we can't you know, defer the meeting. So we're gonna to have to do this. It's gonna be kind of intense. Well, she was up for it. She was very sharp. She learned how to do this. Uh, she did the analysis meetings with me. We did the same kind of a thing where we then took the analysis data to a project steering team, had them review it. We walked them through all the data, answered their questions, dealt with their issues, 
um, got permission to continue to the next phase because that's what a gate review meeting does. You know, they can kill. You know, at a gate review meeting, I tell the clients, you have four decisions at the end of this, you know, as I kick off a meeting. You have four decisions at the end of this meeting. Kill this project because it doesn't make any sense. It may have made sense at one time. It no longer makes any business sense. Let's kill the darn thing. My clients always were uncomfortable or hated me offering that as option number one. But I wanted the people in the room the customer and the stakeholders to know hey kill this thing if it doesn't make any sense i'm fine with that i'm i'm not here to spend your money for no good reason uh two is that maybe we need to defer what we're doing because something else is happening elsewhere and we need to wait for that dust to settle before we tackle the rest of the project so we can put the project on hold defer it for a while and then pick it up and continue on that's option two Option three is modify the approach going forward. Yeah, we're basically on the right track, but we're going to have to do this and that. We're going to have to change the plan going forward. And the fourth option is agree with this, support it, and give us all the people and resources we need to do the next phase. And then we'll check in with you after that phase is all over with. And we'll do the same thing. You can kill it then if necessary or approve it and support it and resource it and we'll move forward. So I really, so PACT, if you'll remember, is performance-based, accelerated, and customer and stakeholder driven. If they decide we need to put things on hold, then that's what we do. And I'm offering that to them because I understand the needs of the business sometimes are that you stop that and wait and see what's going to happen. And then you proceed forward on the same track or a different track, depending on what was going on. And so project steering teams were key and critical. In these gate review meetings, I have one at the end of the project planning, and you know, at the end of all four phases, there's a there's a gate review, and the and at the very end, when the clients are doing the gate review of the implementation plan, we're really setting up the MCD, ADI level, SAM level, design thinking level, agile in instructional design, whatever you want to call that end of the process to, to build instructional content, either performance support that stands alone or performance support, also known as job aids, that you embed in training, or training because you need people to memorize things and hone skills. So, you know, so the, pro so the project steering team is going to see the effort continue on after the curriculum architecture design is done and you start building and buying content, priority content. And the content that you don't fund remains if it's missing unstructured OJT I've been calling it unstructured OJT since the early 70s in the in the 2000s it became informal learning same thing you know trial and error learning um, social learning I usually try to structure social learning by having structured OJT uh, but if it's unstructured OJT we'll name it for you and that's all we're gonna do and you're on your own good luck figure it out you know ask your neighbor do trial and error whatever you got to do but if it's higher risk and high reward I might want to create structured OJT rather than some sort of a group pace mechanism nowadays we have webinars as another group paced uh, forum for instruction rather than just face-to-face -face instructor led training but uh, so the technology has brought us affordances things that we can do a little bit differently nowadays but it's basically the same thing we want to put the customer in charge of driving what it is we're focused on approving things and resourcing things so that we can move forward and we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves um, not only in the review meetings does it give me a chance to do a readout with the client of the data that we've captured to make sure that they are in agreement with it, that they see that we're really actually getting it done, but it also gives me a forum to challenge them uh, about issues and needs that I have or that I see uh, that's going on in the performance. Um, so they get a chance to have their say. Um, I always looked at it as, a, as these uh, gate review meetings as a mechanism for command and control and empowerment. They get to do command and control. I get empowered. They agree with what I'm asking for and they empower me to go forward and do that. Um, and that can be uh, empowering. Um, so the Hewlett-Packard project. So Christy...
and I did this project um, and it, actually the whole effort of which this project was just one tiny piece of they were re-engineering their processes for support and this got a Harvard Business Review write-up this was a big deal project she even got a retention bonus so that she wouldn't leave in the middle of this because they had just invested in training her getting her certified by me that she could do this I mean she and I co-did the analysis meetings and at some point I stepped back and let her finish it off this is how Ray Fenson and I kind of did this initially too um, because I was learning his approach to doing a facilitated group process um, and uh, and the way he preferred doing it, um, even though I had been doing it uh, before at uh, Motorola. Um, and then when we did the design meeting, you know, I started it off and then I turned it over to her and I became her associate and I, I did the stapling and taping and writing and correcting and filling out forms and things like that while she orchestrated the process and which is basically uh, facilitating the data's use with the master performers looking at everything that we did and we'd say doesn't this knowledge and skill need to go here at the beginning of the path or does it go in the middle of the path or does it go at the end of the training and development path and I would tell groups that you know hey I own the process you own the decisions in the process and so I would have to prove that to them that, that was right because they've heard that nonsense before and learned not to believe it so I would say well here's this knowledge and skill item that I knew darn well needed to be taught early in the process early in the training path and I would put it at the end of the path and say I think this goes here near the end this is something you can hold this off forever knowing darn well that it, that was not true and they would say no guy no that goes way up in the front man what are you, you fool and so I'd put it up in the front and I do that two or three times and then I tell them see this is how this works now I knew that that stuff where that probably was gonna should end up but I don't know when we start putting you know 30 40 different things in the front end of the path what the sequence of those 40 things should be you're gonna to have to make those decisions here well here I am inside finishing this video my battery went dead outside so I moved this inside and what we were talking about was the need for the analysis team or design team members to really pay attention to what's going on because while I might declare that I own the process and they own the decisions I'm going to be confronting them with decision after decision after decision and I'm looking for them to give some quick thought to this if they need time to think further about this they need to signal the group that um, they need to ask clarifying questions as they find it necessary but the objective is to make sure that they agree with the data that's being produced that we truly have a group consensus on what the performance is, what the analysis, uh, knowledge and skills are, how the design will f uh, unfold, what goes at the beginning of the path, the middle of the path, and the end of the path. So it's quite involved. It's a tricky thing. People need to have really good facilitation skills for that. Christy had those. So the project was a huge success. Um, that's kind of it for the projects that I wanted to share with you. But then I wanted to also discuss some of the uh, uh, writings that I've done. Now, I, I published my book Lean ISD in 1999 after working on this since 1983 and again I had uh, Gary Rumler's support and all of that. Um, but another book that I wrote co-authored with uh, Ray and Karen back in 1994 was The Marriage of uh, TQM quality kinds of things with performance technology, human performance technology and our book was The Quality Roadmap, uh, we hired a ghostwriter and then decided to give him credit. And so his name, Bruce Wexler, is on the front of that book. Um, I published three articles for the Journal for Quality and Participation uh, between 93 and 95. Uh, the first one was Empowerment is Work, Not Magic. I think I was getting a little bit, you know, what triggers me to write usually is something that annoys me. And so I was hearing all this happy talk about empowerment, 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 as if it was a simple thing. And I didn't believe it was. It's work, not magic. And so I wrote an article about that in September of 93. A few months, uh, well, afterwards, uh, in March 95, I wrote an article on balancing conflicting stakeholder requirements. 
And again, I had heard some nonsense about, uh, you know, the customer is king, the customer is king, the customer is king. And despite Deming uh, not liking slogans, um, I found that my clients were talking like that. And my question to them was, if the customer wants you to do something that's illegal and is going to cause your organization to be fined millions of dollars and have some of your exe executives thrown in jail, is the customer always right? I don't think so. And so I wrote this article about the hierarchy of customers and their requirements and should push come to shove, should requirements conflict, who will win? And I think it's important to clarify that for performers so that especially those that are confronted with, you know, addressing the needs of customers and stakeholders such as regulatory agencies, suppliers, employees, management, etc. How do we reconcile this conflict? And so that was what that article was all about. That was published in March 95. And then a couple months later, I wrote an article on managing and, mis and mismanaging stakeholder expectations. Um, again, uh, published in the Journal for Quality and Participation. And this was based on experience I had at my niece's wedding in Detroit in 94, where she and her groom-to-be months before the wedding had uh, or, or dealt with a car rental company to rent three big huge i think they were white limousines for the big day and when the groom and groomsmen went to go pick those things up the day of the wedding the car company the car rental company did not have three cars of the same color and so they got this uh you know m m's color scheme of uh, you know red blue and white or something i think it was and I was taking video of the niece's wedding. And I remember hearing over and over again, I pulled up to the church, got out, set up the camera, was uh, recording the groomsmen, uh, smoking cigars with the groom to be outside the church and uh, was hearing them relate this story to everybody that entered the church. The minister, when he showed up, he got the cleaned up version and without all the curse words that everybody else was hearing because they were quite upset. And I just thought it was uh, just poor practices for counter people to promise three cars of the same color. They should have known that they're, they couldn't guarantee that. They should have clarified that, explained that. Um, it was a disaster. So that's what that article is all about. Over the years that I spent with Ray, those 15 years, uh, I, I did a lot of presentations. I spoke at NSPI and later ISPI when uh, they need to change the name. I spoke at the ASTD conference numerous times. Lakewood conferences, which are now training magazine conferences. I've spoken at both of those. IEEE conferences targeted at the people in the nuclear industry and the training folks within that. Um, so I've done just a number of presentations. I've done over 100 professional presentations since uh, starting in the business back in uh, 82. Um, uh, Ray and I came together in 2007 to write a book on uh, employee performance-based uh, qualification and certification systems. And this was based on the work that we had done 20 years earlier at Prudhoe Bay and then later on the Alaska Pipeline about setting up uh, qualification performance tests and the administrative systems and all the systems that were necessary to make that happen, to administrate that, to deal with appeals, to maintain all the content of the tests, to certify uh, proctors for the, the test giving. Um, and uh, but anyway, so we include quite a bit of detail in that. We got a little pushback from one of our colleagues that said, you're giving away too much. But the philosophy that we always operated under was that we're going to give everybody, you know, everything. And it's basically like show your work. We're going to share, here's how we do things. Here's specific, detailed, step-by-step -step things. Of course, there's always nuances that you can't quite cover in a book without making it uh, encyclopedia size. But um, our the premise was is that maybe 10 to 20% of the people that, read our book, we'll be able to go off and do it without us, and we've lost that business opportunity. And then there's another 10 to 20% of the people who could never do it, may not see any value in it, and you know, that doesn't matter. And it's maybe the 40 to 60% in the middle that um, should they have a need, might remember us, remember that we could provide a, a 
a great amount of detail, just not a fair amount of detail, but a great amount of detail, and that we know what we're doing. And if this is really high stakes performance, perhaps the first time they do something like this, they want to engage us to do that. And just like I, with Christy Westall at Hewlett Packard, I was more than happy to, uh, and we were always happy to develop our clients, to teach them what we know. Of course, you know, they have to buy our time to do that and uh, whatever preparation we might need to do that. Um, we, because there's informal ways to do that and a little bit more formal ways and very formal ways to do that. Like when I did all the work at General Motors, that was all very formal, uh, structured, uh, pack process, technology transfer work. Um, but so Ray and I kind of came together, even though uh, we ended the business in, in uh, 97. Um, my wife, Karen, and I had separated and divorced a year, a couple years earlier than that. And I knew that, um, th that we couldn't stay in the same business for very long. That just wasn't going to work. And, but my issue was is that I only owned one third of all the curriculum architecture design methodology and the MCD methodology and the other methodologies that I had created over the years. And, uh, uh, but on the other hand, I owned one third of Ray Svensson's strategic planning for training and development methodology because I was a partner. And so I owned my one third of that. So I was going to have to wait it out and let them come to me and suggest that we break up the business and then we could do a little horse trading about methodologies and intellectual property. So we had to go through all of that. And I took my intellectual property, my tools, like the PAC database, et cetera, and I started a new business, uh, which will be the subject of the next video in this uh, Insomnia Solution series. Oh, excuse me, it's really the uh, Adventures in Training, Performance-Based Training and Development with me, Guy Wallace. Anyway, so stay tuned for that if you're interested or if you're still awake and can't get to sleep. So the next video will be up in the next couple of days. Cheers.